Welcome to the With Winning in Mind podcast. I'm Heather Sumlin with Troy Basham, and today we're breaking down the keys to consistency. We have four different steps that if you follow, you might be able to be consistent in your sport. Okay, Troy, I want you to cover some of the keys to consistency that we talked about. So give us a little bit of a overview. Overview? Of keys to consistent. Well, there's four main things we talk about when it comes to key things. We say keys to consistency, but I think you could say keys to success. Mm -hmm. Well, consistency leads to success, right? Yes. Perfect. And so the the first one is this idea that, you know, you want to have a strict adherence to your mental system. And so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So when you think about strict adherence, what do you think? What, What do you picture? Well, there's got to be some process I have to follow. And I have to do it every single time. Yeah. So I, I need to do it. Otherwise, there's consequences, right? Right. So when I think of strict, I think of parents. Yeah. But I find a when lot of When they give people, me rules. Yes. If you don't follow the and rules. if I don't follow the rules, consequences. Bad things happen. Yes. You have, you have a teenager at home. I bet you, yeah. you have rules that they do. push it. And if they don't abide by it, bad. If they do abide by it, good. Yes. Yeah, well, competition is no different, right? Absolutely. So when we look at it, it's funny how from a technical standpoint, everyone does a really good job trying to stick with the order of things. If I do this, then this, then this, it should be producing this, mm-hmm. right? If I do X and Y, it produces Z kind of thing. But when it comes to the mental game, it's like everyone's just free to think about whatever they want, and they just kind of go with the flow. Where we're looking and said, okay, you want a mental process just like you have a technical process so a good example would be take someone in a proactive sport right like which one well let's just take golf for example Mm -hmm. a golfer walks up to a ball they can't just pick up a club and hit the ball i mean they could but they're probably not gonna be successful just grab a a, any club and hit it right there there's things that they need to look at well is there an order that they're breaking things down so we just had the masters you Mm -hmm. know that just happened you know one of the the greatest sporting events that we have in in our country. And so you're watching some of the best people in the sport compete. Oh, and there was some really, really good golf last week. Yeah. Oh, it was did you watch any? No. Oh. I did. It was really good. It was really good. I was I was kind of Well, the for, only thing I watched was you were watching it in your office. Yeah. Occasionally. And so I saw a couple of things just because No, I had the Masters app here on my little iPad off to the side, so while I was doing email, I was kind of looking. But it's your so. job. It's your job to keep up with that because the golf is one of your target markets. Well, and you look at, at the Masters right now, you got Tiger Woods, hadn't played in over a year mm-hmm. you know, from that accident, and so you really want to know what he was going to do. You had Scotty Scheffler, who's Texas guy. Mm-hmm. You know, Of course, we're in Texas, so you're like, okay, is he going to still be – he's been dominant this year. Yeah. This, this guy has won – he's – of the tournament, granted, there hasn't been a whole lot of tournaments. You know, he's played about 12 tournaments this year, but he's finished over 50% of the tournaments he's played in. He's finished top 10. He's won four of them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's exciting. So you're like, okay, how's he going to do at the Masters? Right. Okay. Because right. it's the first major. So you had that going. Mm-hmm. You had a couple other scenarios. Like the one main scenario is, oh, all the past winners get to come and play. So who who are the past winners are going to be in, in contention? So you always have that dynamic. So you're looking at that. But one of the things that you'll see, the, the ones that are really good, they all follow a strict order of how they're breaking things down. So they walk up to a shot and it's like this specific order. Like, okay, I'm going to look at the lie. I'm going to get the yardage. I'm going to look at the conditions I have. I might talk to my caddy and and break that down, get their opinion, take that information, and then make a decision. Okay, so they're doing a specific order breaking down that decision. But when you work with younger athletes, and I work with a a variety of of golfers, the younger ones, they'll walk up and they don't have a specific order. Like they'll they'll sit there and they're like, oh, I'm going to look at the winds coming from this direction. And then they try to get the yardage and then they, they get the lie. When the last shot, they had a whole different order. You know, they got the yardage first, and then they're they're trying to look at the lie, and, and they don't even pay attention to the conditions or something like that. There's not a consistent order of things, so they overlook things. They don't make the right decision. They execute what they think is a good shot, but guess what happens? They don't get a good result because they didn't follow a strict 
you know, process. So are you, are you saying that in golf, in this example, not only do you have to look for these things, you have to look for these things in the same order every single time. Every order, especially so in forget. proactive sports. The same is, you know, we work with archery, we work with any shooting sport that you have that's proactive elements in sport. You got to have a specific order of, of doing things. From a technical standpoint, people do a very good job of this. Mm -hmm. But from a mental standpoint, people don't think twice about it. They just say, well, I'm just going to do this. So the other day, um, for those of you who are not yet Patreon members, we recorded over the last three weeks or so, we recorded what to do in the preload, which is kind of like the pre-shot routine, but mentally, what to do in the mental program, what to do in the action phase of a task and in the, in the reload, what to do, to do afterwards. And we posted those videos just going through the entire process on our Patreon channel for our silver and gold level members. So if you are not a member, I highly recommend that you join so that you can understand exactly what we're talking about because we don't have the time to go through it today. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of make sure people knew about that. Yeah, well, that also, if we, if we just piggyback from that, if you don't have a strict way of doing things that mm -hmm. we're talking about, an order and following the order and doing it on a consistent basis, then how are you going to do the second thing? Which is the second thing is all about focusing on execution, not on winning or outcome. Okay, now that's hard for people, I think. Because I feel like people think they have to think about winning in the competition, like they have to try real hard. How do you get them to switch that thought? Well, the whole trying really hard is a myth anyway. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at the, the top 5% is the guys that do most of the winning, right? Mm -hmm. What's the one thing that they say a lot is if you want to guarantee that you lose, give it 110% and you'll lose every single time. And the reason is because if you are giving more than 100%, mm -hmm. then by default, you are over trying. And over trying is the number one reason good athletes don't perform well in competition. But what are we told? You got to try really hard. You got to do your very, very best. And for most people, that means I'm going to give it a little extra. Well, and that's what's so interesting to me, too, because in practice, they're not doing that. They're not trying hard in practice. And in practice, they're able to execute. And then they get in competition and they believe for some reason they got to do a little extra or add a little more. And that defeats the purpose. Yeah. But when you look at, again, the proactive elements that you have, if I do the steps I'm supposed to do, Mm -hmm. shouldn't it generate the result I want? Absolutely. So in, in my sport growing up, it's very simple. If I hold a gun a certain way, if I you know, look through the sights, if everything's right, I'm aligned perfectly, it settles, I don't move, and the gun goes off, I should have a good result. From a physical standpoint, that's true, but from a mental standpoint, that's also true. If, I'm, if it comes down, it settles in, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that looks good. Well, I just cost myself a second. I could have got the shot off when it was really good. But now I'm thinking, oh, that looks really good. That would have been a perfect time for the shot to go up. But now it didn't go off. Why? Because I'm thinking, it looks really, really good. And then I'm thinking, well, I need to shoot it. Why isn't it going off? Well, because that's not a normal thought process that a shooter would have in doing a normal shot. Mm -hmm. You know, A normal shot would be it settles in, I confirm it, boom, it goes off. Like, I'm not thinking of words in my head. I'm focusing on settles in. I'm making sure that it's centered. As soon as it's centered, I controlled pull and boom. Don't move. Goes off. Got a good result. But if I start thinking, and what am I thinking about? Oh, the hold's really good. Oh, I'm going to get a good result. Right. No, you want, you want to focus on the execution. So what is the process for what I need to do? Well, think about what is the thought process you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would focus on is the approach coming down 12. I'm focusing on 12 o'clock. I'm focusing on it settling. I'm focusing on it, on confirming the, the white ring around that black dot is equal. And if it is, then I'm just thinking the last thing I would say to myself is slower, smaller, slower, smaller. And then in that last slower, smaller, the gun will go off. And nine times out of 10, it'd be a great shot. Awesome. But if I didn't do that, and I'm thinking, oh, I need this one. Or don't mess oh, up. Oh, like it matters. Oh, no. And those are winning. Those are outcome-oriented mm -hmm. kind of things. But it's very easy to get caught up in thinking about winning, thinking about outcome. Now, there are times where you can think about it. Like you know, in like training. At, yeah, training after the competition's over. But I had a uh, 
this kid just turned 13. He's a golfer. He's really – guy's got an unbelievable talent. He didn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's got that much natural good. ability. Yeah. yeah, He's like, here, watch this, and he just hits it. But he can't describe what he's doing, mm-hmm. right? But he just he just does it. Well, he's playing – you know, he's 13, but they're in the under 15. So he's playing with kids that are a year or two older than him. You know, he just turned 13, so he's like – you know, kind of smaller, younger, but he's 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 quite good. Mm-hmm. And so he calls me. He's in Mexico competing in an event. He competed the first two days. It's a three-day event. And he calls me up. He was like, man, he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous. I'm like, why? He goes, I'm in fourth place. Now I'm thinking, why would you be nervous in fourth place? I'm not, I'm not nervous in fourth place. First place, I understand why you'd be nervous because I only have one place to go down. Mm. But if you're second lower – the way I'm looking at it is I got one place to go up, yeah. right? So I'm like, why? This is going into like the last day of the tournament. Yeah, he's got oh. one day. The next gotcha. day is the last day. And he's like, you know, I really think if I play the way I've been playing, I could win. And, and and I'm really nervous and I don't know what to do. And, of course, you know, I'm, I'm thinking the obvious. <laughs> Just keep doing what you've been doing. Right, exactly. That's what everyone would Stop think Stop thinking about winning. <laughs> and so... I told him, I said, well, the good news is is much easier to gain two or three strokes in, in golf than it is to maintain a two or three stroke lead. It's much easier. So the pressure's on your opponent, not on you. So the person who's in third and second and first, mm-hmm. they have pressure you don't have. Mm-hmm. So now the question I have for you is, what did you do today and yesterday? Right. Walk me through. So he, he walked me through. You know what he walked me through? He walked me through how he was thinking. He walked me through a process. It was all execution. He didn't talk about why well, birdie this hole, birdie that hole. He mentioned why well, I did this and this, and then I want a burning that hole. So yes. there was an order there. It was the execution. I said, okay, so you need to focus on that tomorrow and see what happens. What do you think happened? I think he won. He did. He won the tournament. Why? Because so he's cool. not thinking about winning in the in the tournament. Now he can figure this out at this young age. Mm-hmm. Anybody oh, can do it. He's yep. gonna huge. But the the pull to think about outcome is there because we live in a world that's all about outcome. Well, it's that's results. what gets rewarded. Yeah. Okay. That's so what's the third step? So you we have can't watch TV, man, because everyone's focusing on someone's results and so forth. And sometimes it's true. like, oh, this guy didn't win. I'm upset. And the guy, he was a fan of that person, is all excited. And he's just bragging about it, you know. And then next thing you know, you got an argument, you know, with uh, that's going on at work and that There's kind of stuff. And everything. But that's why. That's why I like it. So the the third one. Yeah. The further third one is you need to become proactive about protecting and building your self image. So this is probably. A, a a big conversation how to grow build protect self image so so what's the short version of what you mean well this is your wheelhouse you work with a lot of self image building mm-hmm. so i want i want to take a little different approach if i can okay go for it okay so when we're talking about self image self image is where confidence comes in mm-hmm. i subscribe to i think someone can be taught and be able to create confidence. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're just born confident. Mm-hmm. Now, I think there's some people that are. I think some people just, they got it and they, or they don't kind of thing. But I think you can get it. I think you can build a self-image that, oh, yeah, I'm good. Would you agree to that? Yes. Okay. But I think because we live in a, in a negative world, because mm-hmm. we do live in a negative world, mm-hmm. so it's just easy to play that role. Isn't it? Easy to play what role? The pessimistic role. Oh. The negative role rather than the optimistic positive role. Well, there's right? lots of things you could focus on. And if you're choosing to focus on what you don't like, then that's negative. That actually hurts self-image. If yeah. you're choosing to think about what you what you do like or what's positive, beneficial, good, focusing on what you're grateful for, those type of things actually tend to build you. Yeah, we talk about become proactive, not be proactive, because it, you can't be proactive until you become the person mm-hmm. it's like to do that. Right. Okay, so, well, what are some ways that you can protect your, your self-image? I'll, I'll start. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll go back and forth. We'll, we'll name a few here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the easy route right off the bat. Avoid negative people. Surround yourself with positive influence individuals. And that will help protect your self-image. So I got a great one for you. Okay. Last night, 
was talking to Earl Rex, mm-hmm. one of our favorite people. Shout out Earl. He's he's like our favorite New Yorker. Okay, perfect. Right? Yeah. So talking to Earl, and, and Earl, he's, I mean, he still competes in tennis and golf. It's amazing mm-hmm. and what well, he does. But he was telling me yesterday, he's like, you know, the best advice I ever got in golf was, is what? He was watching an interview, and there's this guy that was able to meet a phenom golfer. This was years ago, back in the day. And uh, he says, look, what what separates you from other people? He says, man, I, I learned this one rule, and I follow this rule. So if I was going to give any advice to anybody, it would be this. Always have dinner with good putters. Okay. And Earl's like, isn't that amazing? Always I mean, have think dinner about that. with good putters. And, and, and he goes, why do you think that that's so powerful? Because he's been doing that. He's mm-hmm. like, if I'm in a golf tournament and I'm going to have dinner with people, I refuse to have dinner with someone who's going to talk bad about the putting. Well, if you're always having dinner with good putters, they never talk bad about the putting. Because they're confident in their putting. Yeah, and in that sport, putting is the closest thing to seeing what the result may or may not be. Uh-huh. So I don't want to talk about the negative thoughts. I want, to, I want to have positive thoughts. Well, it's going to be easier to have positive thoughts if you're around positive people. So if you're around... People who are good at something, yeah, I'm I'm great putter. Well, what do you think they're going to talk about? Great stuff. Therefore, self image. All can those grow. all those imprints of the hole, of the ball sinking into the hole over and over again. Yeah, and they're yeah, sharing different stories with each other, and you're hearing about it, and then they're asking, well, "What about you?" And then you you get to share mm-hmm. something like that. That is a good example of protecting self-image from an environmental standpoint. So if you're going to hang around people, hang around people who are really good at what they do because you probably get a lot of good imprints. All right, so that, that's the easy one. What, what about you? What's a good one for you that oh, you, you tell people? I, I do agree you've got to control your environmental influences. So your support system definitely needs to be positive people who have your best interest at heart, who aren't going to talk about your competition. They're going to be focused on you and helping you and growing you. So I think that's true. I also think it's important if we're talking about protecting self-image that sometimes you're going to be in an environment that's not ideal. There's going to be things or people that are negative or focusing on negative things. And so being able to internalize what you want in an environment that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. So being really... um, crafty, if you will, at what you choose to think about no matter what is said around you, no matter what's going on around you, being overly optimistic and bringing into your mind the things that are valuable. That's a little mental gymnastics going on right there. That's not so yeah. easy. It's not easy, but man, it's fun. When, when you get you to where you're good example? at it. Um, well, so I work in subjective graded sports. Um, let's talk pageantry for a second. Sometimes there might be people who are talking negatively around you. I mean, it can be tiring. Sometimes these competitions are a full week. You're in heels every single day. You're a little hangry sometimes. And so occasionally you'll be around people who might be focusing on the things that they don't like, whether it's the environment, the choreography, the fact that their feet hurt, whatever it is. A judge. <laughs> I mean, it could be. They could think yeah. that, that a judge didn't like them, whatever. Yeah. And so there could be someone saying something like, man, Man, my feet hurt. Well, come on, your feet hurt too. Like they do. I mean, for real. Yeah. I do not wear heels for this reason. Okay. But if you're focusing on how bad your feet hurt, does that help you? No. No. Now all of a sudden you're in pain and now you're focusing on the pain. And now you're getting more tired because you're thinking about the thing. So we don't want to do that. So instead, this person's talking about their feet hurt. This is kind of a silly scenario, but it happens. They're talking about that and you're internalizing you know what? I enjoy walking in my heels. I just really like being here. I like picking something else that you can focus on. And there are some, there are some that really do. Oh yeah. They like walking hills. They, they like, they feel powerful. That, yeah. They mm-hmm. like that aspect of it, but you're right. I, I do not want to experience that. Thank goodness. I don't have to. Yeah. You know, I can imagine, you know, you're, you've been in hills and basically walking on your toes all day long and that kind of stuff. Or even like a long rehearsal. You know, you're stuck at rehearsals for a long, long, long period of time. And you kind of like, you know the routine. You don't need to go over it again. But they're going to make you go over it again. And so instead of thinking about, man, this is so annoying. I really want sleep. I'm super hungry. Instead of thinking about that, it's like, you know what? 
one more run through, that's actually going to help me. I'm going to imprint a really great run through. Yeah, really trying to twist that to where I'm not getting down. Right. Being build up. Yeah, it's kind of like the the individual that comes up to you and like you perform pretty good. Like I share the, the story. I thought I probably have shared this in the past where I had a team of mine shooting a, a prone event, 60 shots, and he shoots a nine on the first shot, shoots 58 tens in a row, shoots a nine on the last shot. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, you know, at the end of the competition, you're, you're cleaning your rifle, breaking things down, you know, getting ready to leave. And so I'm talking with him, and this guy comes up, younger shooter, comes up mm-hmm. to him. He goes, man, what happened on those bookends? Meaning he's focused on the first and the last shot, right? right? And immediately he looks at the guy. He goes, so you don't want to know how I shot 58 tens in a row? Mm-hmm. Now, what do you think I pictured when he said that? 58 tens. Yeah. Man, if, if you and could Dad run, would do that all the time, too. Yeah, if you could run that. And that's an example of choosing to picture something different than what the environment mm-hmm. is telling you to do that's going to protect your mm-hmm. self-image. But if you don't become the person that can do that on a regular basis, mm-hmm. there's, you're going to fall victim to bring yourself down, not building yourself up for that one. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with another easy one. Okay. We, we've tackled this one several times on our podcast, and that is keeping a performance analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day when you're training, writing down what went well specifically in detail, and if you could explain not just what you did, but kind of how you did it that day, maybe give an example. I think that's powerful because there's a lot of times you're going to be in a situation to where it's like, you know, I just wish it would have been a little bit better. Could have been a good day. Might have been an average day, but you're wishing it would be better. I think that happens a lot. There's going to be a few times where you're going to have that day where like, my gosh, it's like I can think of one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, But it's amazing how you writing that one thing down, bringing closure to it really helps protect but you have to become someone that's like them to write things down in a good positive way to build confidence on a daily basis when you train and compete a lot of people don't want to do that so going back to protecting self-image if you have your journal with you and you're at a tournament or you're at a competition and you start to doubt right you have those moments of doubt you grab your journal and you flip back through the what went well you're reminded of how good you actually are of what's actually true about you. And then all of a sudden, all those imprints, build self-image, build self-image, build confidence, if you will, and then you're gonna perform even better. But if you're not keeping Mm -hmm. a journal, you can't reflect on it. So you gotta get started. Yeah, so do you have another one off the top of your head? Of protecting self-image? Yeah, we just gave three. Of becoming someone who could protect their self-image. Well, I think you first you have to understand why protecting your self-image is so incredibly important. And realizing that we perform up to our self-image, not our skill level. And so a lot of times we think, well, if we're skilled and then we'll just perform up to our skill no matter what, but that's not true. If that was true, everybody everybody would reach the potential. Right. And so you absolutely have to believe that you're capable of reaching your potential under immense pressure or in whatever scenario that you're in. And so to me, yes, it's, it's protecting your self-image by being around the right people, um, by controlling your thoughts no matter what's being said around you. But then it's also not beating yourself up. I think the internal dialogue about yourself, and maybe it's because I I work with a ton of teenagers and they tend to be very critical of themselves. And their internal dialogue is is sad, actually. The woe is me, huh? Well, it's almost like, it's in some ways it's worse. It's, it's, I'm horrible. Like it's, it's mean, it's not like a victim thing. It's like a, I'm bad. And it makes me sad because you're not. You're learning. Every single day you're growing. Every single day you're learning. Every single day there's something of value that you have to give to the world. There's something of value that you've done today. You've had something great and yet we're focusing all the negatives. And so I think to me the most important thing is to change the way you communicate with yourself in a way that grows you instead of destroys you. Yeah. And we go into a lot of detail on that on our Patreon and our products. And if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing and what we're talking about, join our Patreon or like this channel or subscribe to it. We want to make sure that we're giving you more and more information to be helpful to you. Yeah, and and the final one on this whole topic that we're talking about with keys to having consistency and and being successful is this idea of trying just hard enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we briefly hit on 
you know, giving 110% is guaranteed way to lose. What does that really mean? It means that this cup can only hold this amount. Right. I mean, if, if I try to put 110% of water in this cup, it's going to overflow. It's going to make a mess. It's going to make a, b- a big old mess. So the idea is that how can I use this to its full potential? I can fill it up to the brim mm-hmm. and that's it. Right. If I only fill it up halfway, I'm not using the full advantage of the cup. If I try to overflow, then I'm going to create a mess because it can't handle more, right? Mm-hmm. There's only so much this cup can handle. It's the same way with us in sport. There's only so much I can do from an effort standpoint. So if I give the right amount of effort, it makes it much easier to perform well. And that's the whole idea of trying just hard enough. Don't force issues. Let them, you know, let the the, the results come to you. Mm-hmm. You know, your job is to go perform. Trust is going to work out. And that's probably one of the hardest things for real competitive people to do. Because mm-hmm. it's very, if you're extremely competitive, over trying is really easy. If you're extremely intelligent in your sport, you know, you have a high IQ mm-hmm. in your sport or your activity or, or your work, very easy to overthink things. Those two things will make you work harder than you need to. Mm-hmm. You want to work efficiently. Not effortlessly, but it should feel that way, mm-hmm. right? And much more difficult, much easier to be said than done. But one of the things that I found to to hit on the, well, how do I know I'm trying just hard enough? Well, how easy is it to run your technical mental process during a competition? Mm. You know, do you, like are, you, are you playing like you were a kid or are you working? Ooh, are you enjoying it? I mean, you look at look at the, all the professional sports, right? Mm-hmm. When they make these incredible plays, it doesn't look like they're trying. It, it just happens. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, how did you do that? I don't know. I just did it. Because they're just enjoying that, that moment. All the hard work is done in preparation. The fun is done in, in competition. That's one of the things I like about the, the NFL when you, you watch them coming out. You know, like the home team, they're coming out and they're, they're like all excited. They look like little kids. Yeah. You know, grown men are acting like little kids, yelling and dancing and high five each other, like just, oh, I'm ready to go. They're like, I'm ready for this. I want to have fun out there, and I want to, I want to, you know, be successful. But they look like they were back in school, back when they were like 10, 12, 13 years of age. And all the hard work was done the week prior. Now let's go out and have fun. And I think if, if you can figure that out, you have a huge advantage of your, of your competition. In conclusion, if you want to learn how to run a solid mental system so that you can trust in it, join our Patreon. We break it down for you. If you want to learn how to protect your self-image in order to do your best in competition, join us also on some of our webinars that we're doing. We've got some webinars coming up soon that might be very helpful for you. So if you want to follow the keys to consistency, we recommend that you do. Go ahead and comment and see how it works out for you. Ask us some questions. Like this episode if you do. Subscribe to our channel and we'll see you next time.